Hi, welcome, welcome everybody. Lovely to see you. I'm just letting people in. I'll try and just give it two minutes just to let everybody arrive and then hopefully then we can just kind of settle in. Jenny, Holly, I see you more lovely. Caitlin, hi darling, I see you. We've got just a half hour session today. So if you want to just get yourself ready and settled, you're welcome to do so. If you want to get yourself a nice cup of tea, if you want to wrap yourself in a blanket, whatever you'd like to do that feels most restful and nourishing for you, feel free to use this this half hour is just a little break from the day, a little, a little retreat into a little myth and magic. So feel free to, to find your place. You can have your video off if you like. I've got everyone on mute so you can hustle and bustle around to heart's content. We'll just take one more minute and then that probably, I say, touch wood, be our number. If anyone came to the the last one that we did in September, I had this dream of having all the candles going and it was so hot. I had this little strappy top on and the sun was beating through. And so my idea of it being autumnal magic was was out the window last, last month in September. But um, here in October, it's definitely chilly now. So I've got my jumper, I've got the candles on. So that autumnal dream has been realized this month. <laughs> oh, Effie says that she's on the bus. She's got her earphones in. Lovely. How fun that you can attend and have... Oh, there, I see you. I see you on the bus. Hello, darling. <laughs> How lovely it is that you can attend an event on the bus or wherever you are. I love that. I think that's um, it's just a joyful thing that we can connect in in slightly different ways, but uh, how lovely that there are more more ways to connect than ever before. It's all very exciting. I think that might be our number. So welcome, welcome everybody. Welcome to this collection of just a few folk and fairy tales, legends and poems drawn from my new book, Kitchen Witch, Food, Folklore and Fairy Tale. It's a book, as you might imagine, all about food, but also magic and witches. And it will actually be available to pre-order at the end of next month, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. So take your time to get settled, whether you're on the bus or in your living room, wherever you are. And if you want to close your eyes, you're welcome to do so to just help journey into this place of magic. Some of what I'll speak to today are tales and superstitions that specifically feature the character of the witch in their many forms. Others are more stories and anecdotes that may have been told by some of these wise women or kitchen witches or healers from around the world at their hearth fires. Some of the stories are also based in actual history, especially uh, some of the witch hunts of Europe. And hopefully all the stories I share will, will just hold a little bit of magic and enchantment about food and drink for you. So I named this session Storms Are Brewing because I liked the idea of it being sort of a pun because especially in Europe, witches had a, there was a superstition that a witch could raise up a storm at sea. But of course, witches are also well known for brewing potions and even their ability to perhaps see the future in the bottom of a teacup. So these stories are pulled from different areas of the book, so forgive me if it's it's a little sporadic, but that's very storm appropriate, I suppose. First, we'll look at brews made by witches, some very familiar potions. We're going to look at both tea and beer, <laughs> and then we'll move on to storms that may possibly have been brewed up by the witches. We'll work through a little folklore, a little superstition and a little bit of actual history. And then we'll end with a little folklore and a lovely fairy tale featuring witches that set sail upon boats. So we'll start with beer and tea and how they can be considered magical and even a tool of the witch. Now we're going to start with a beer witch. A drink not of beer, just of water. <laughs> 
So there is a whole section on beer in the Kitchen Witch book. Too much for me to read to you here. But I thought I would whet your appetite with the tale of a beer witch. So this story is drawn from an epic poem from Finland. It's known as the Kalevala. It was written back in 1835. It's a long, hence epic poem. <laughs> but within this little section of the story, there are beer witches and magical maidens. It's an amazing story. The essence is that the mistress of the North, a witch called Lohi, needs beer for the great wedding of her daughter, who is the maiden of the rainbow. So she seeks the help of Osmata, the Finnish goddess of beer, who creates a magical brew made with heart-easing honey that sparkles and overflows from cauldrons. And she does this with the help of her mystic maidens, Alavata and Kapo, and a bee who takes a trip to honey fields of magic to help source them what they need. I'm going to read you a little section of the Kalevala here. I'm going to take a deep breath. <laughs> and a honey bee came flying from the pod within her fingers. Capo thus addressed her birdling, little bee with honeyed winglets. King of all the fragrant flowers, fly thou whither I direct thee, to the islands and the oceans. Gather there the sweetened juices, gather honey on thy winglets. From the palaces of flowers, from the tips of seven petals, bring it to the hands of Capo, to the hands of Ozma's daughter. Then the bee, the swift-winged birdling, flew away with lightning swiftness on this journey to the islands in the honey fields of magic. By her side were honeyed grasses, by her lips were fragrant flowers, silver stalks with golden petals. But the sweetest of the flowers brought back honey to Capo, to the mystic maiden's fingers. Osmatar, the beer preparer, placed the honey in the liquor. Capo mixed the beer with honey and the wedding beer fermented rose the live beer upward, upward, from the bottom of the vessels, upward in the tubs of birchwood, foaming higher, 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 till it touched the oaken handles, overflowing all the cauldrons. To the ground it foamed and sparkled, sank away in sand and gravel. Time had gone but little distance, scarce a moment had passed over, ere the heroes came in numbers to the foaming beer of Northland, rushed to drink this sparkling liquor, said to make the feeble hardy, famed to dry the tears of women, famed to cheer the broken-hearted, and make the aged young and supple, make the timid brave and mighty, make the brave men ever braver, fill the heart with joy and gladness, fill the mind with wisdom sayings, and fill the tongue with ancient legends. So that is a small section of the Kalevala, which I hope you'll agree is magical and beautiful and delightful that it carries uh, some foodstuffs, honey and beer, beautiful. So it was lovely to, <laughs> to bring that together uh, and, and share some of that in the book. Let's move from beer to tea, a brew that is magic in more than one way. So I always see as tea, tea is a very everyday sort of magic. It's not a native plant to the British Isles, it originates from Asia, but it has become a fundamental part of our culture here. And tea, coffee and hot chocolate all arrived in the British Isles around the 1600s and each became popular in certain groups of society. At first tea was a treat for nobility because they could afford the sugar and the sweet treats that kind of came along with taking tea and allow it to be a real occasion. And at the time, coffee was the cheaper beverage, but as prices dropped with trading deals and things like colonialism, uh, by the 1800s, tea was consumed by virtually everyone here in the British Isles, from royalty to factory workers to farmers. And it continues to be very popular today and available to all, and is pretty much considered a cure for everything from a broken heart to shock, to something to offer visitors with a biscuit, to a morning staple and afternoon refreshment. Specifically here in England, we have cream tea, which is a pot of tea accompanied by scones and cream and jam. We've got afternoon tea, which is tea with sandwiches and dainty cake, 
tide one over until dinner. There's tea time, which is another name for dinner. Not to mention tea dances, tea parties, tea breaks, and elevenses, which is when one stops for a little break at 11 for a cup of tea and maybe a tea cake. And to offer tea and sympathy is to offer care, a kindly ear, and a cuppa to somebody who is upset. So this is a simple, beautiful magic that can be found within a warm cup of tea. But what about tea as a magical tool for witches or workers of magic? Well, that brings us to tassiomancy. Tassiomancy is a form of divination that interprets patterns in tea leaves. It can also be coffee grounds or wine sediment. In fact, anything can be used for divination as humans have sought to interpret what the threads of life may have in store for them. In ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, oils and inks were used. They were added to bowls of water and patterns were read. Towards the end of the medieval period in Europe, fortune tellers might use tarot cards. The first decks appeared around 1440. But many people would give readings from drink sediments, splatters of wax, or even the way stones or bones fell upon the earth. There is a book called Reading Tea Leaves by an author who simply goes by the name A Highland Seer, which is written in the 18th century, and it's thought to be one of the oldest books of tassiomancy in English, although the practice would be centuries older. And this book offers a set of symbols and um, patterns that the tea leaves could form and helps one learn this art of how to, how to read the tea leaves and how to see things that may come to pass. Now, tea leaf readers might also call door to door, and during the Victorian era, this became very popular as a kind of light entertainment, and the Victorians, with their seances, were quite interested in spiritualism. So ladies might host social gatherings that centred around tea leaves or divining, and even uh, pottery businesses of the time actually made teacups with special symbols, like zodiac symbols, to help people read themselves. And although practices are different from country to country, you might see some universal symbols. So, for example, hearts, coins or flowers would connect to ideas of love and prosperity. Though a witch might be able to predict perhaps an oncoming storm or other events with her tassiomancy, her skill with tea leaf reading. Or perhaps superstition suggests that she may raise that storm herself. And if we head back in time to our very earliest agricultural ancestors, women were some of the earliest agriculturalists tending gardens and seeds. And women observed the course of seasons and the weather, and many would, because they had to, become skilled in predicting the course and pattern of weather and seasons. But the superstition evolved that witches could raise a storm, but this is far more likely their very real ability to predict when a storm was coming. But no doubt these superstitions were taken advantage of by perhaps cunning folk who were only too happy to sell fair winds to sailors, which would come in the form of knotted ropes. They would say that a wind or a storm was held within each knot and the sailors could unravel them to evoke more winds or a storm if they so wished. So these suspected witches may have foreseen forthcoming changes in weather, also the seasons. And again, it was a practice skill as they observed people and society, they may well have also been able to predict things such as romances or family health. So what to many appeared to be magic that witches could create storms at will was much more likely to be skilled in prediction but one that they would be subject to blame for. Now, going back to superstitions of witches, when you go through all the implements that they were said to fly upon, there are stories of witches flying on pestles and mortars, in cauldrons, on oven forks, in barrels, on mops, on spoons, and of course, on broomsticks. Flying on broomsticks was particularly relevant to superstition in Central Europe, 
which is in England were apparently far more likely to simply walk or ride upon animals. But the broom has still become one of our most prevalent stereotypes of the witch. But it's also interesting that from that long list, a lot of what we're seeing are kitchen tools and the witch was consistently connected to ideas of cooking things up in the kitchen, of brewing things in the kitchen, and her magic was connected to these instruments of the kitchen. So another instrument of the kitchen is the sieve. And particularly in a kind of notorious witch trial known as the North Berwick Witch Trials, a group of women were famously accused of plotting to raise a storm to sink the ship of King James. That's King James of both England and Scotland. He had a different name in the two different countries. I think he was King James the first in Scotland. He was a different King James, a different number in England. It's easy to get confused with this history. Uh, but anyway, King James was on this ship and these storms were so wild, so outrageous that the crew assumed that only supernatural causes could have raised it. And it was actually that event, that storm, that fostered King James's personal fear and hatred of witches, so much so that he would go on to write the book Demonology in 1597, which was a treatise of witch hunt techniques and how to hunt out and torture witches. So that superstition of those storms had a very real effect on people and women and witches later on. But coming back to the North Berwick Witch Trials, one of the women of the Berwick Witch Trials was a folk healer called Agnes Sampson. And under duress, she confessed, and it's always useful to remember that they always, you know, they were always under duress. They never kind of confessed uh, free and easily. It was always an ordeal. But upon the night of Halloween, she said, some 200 witches all gathered together and they went to sea in riddles and sieves. Riddles is just another term for a sieve. So they went to sea in riddles and sieves and with great flagons of wine, they had a merry old time along the way before raising that great storm that so scared King James. When it comes to setting sail on the ocean, another very popular method, allegedly, of the witch was within shells. Witches were said to sail in eggshells, cockle shells, mussel shells, through and under tempestuous seas. And because apparently witches could set sail in eggshells, it became a common practice in the British Isles and Europe to crush eggshells or poke them full of holes to prevent the witches setting sail in them. From that place, upon the waves, they might then go about raising storms or wrecking ships, or as some witches from Norfolk in England were said to do, they could drown sailors by stirring up eggshells in pails of water, creating tiny storms in buckets in order to raise storms out at sea. But witches could also use those eggshells for good, and that brings us to a fairy tale. Oh. Take another sip of water, excuse me for a moment. So this is a fairy tale about eggshells. <laughs> it's called The Gypsy Girl and the Grateful Witch, and it's from a version I found in an old book by Charles Godfrey Leyland. He wrote this in 1891, and it was a book about sorcery and fortune telling. The story goes like this. Once there was a gypsy girl who noticed that when anyone ate eggs, they broke up the shells. And she asked why, and she received this answer. You must break the shell to bits for fear, lest the witches should make a boat, my dear. For over the sea, away from home, far by night, the witches roam. The girl pondered this answer. I don't see why the poor witches should not have boats as well as other people, she said. And so what she did, she threw the shell of the egg that she had been eating as far as she could. She threw it into the air and she said, Choviani, Latrobero, which there is your boat. And to her amazement, the little shell caught up in the wind and whirled away. And a voice cried, Paraka, I thank you. Now, it came to pass that some time later, 
The gypsy girl was caught in a great flood. She was trapped on a small piece of land and the rain was lashing in and the water was rising higher and higher and she was sure that she would drown. But just in time, she saw a woman in a white boat, a woman with witch's eyes. She was rowing the boat with a broom and a black cat sat upon her shoulder. Jump in, she said to the girl, and she rowed her to dry land. And when they arrived at the shore, the woman said, turn around three times to the right and look at the boat each time. As the girl did so, each time she turned and looked, she saw the boat grow smaller and smaller and smaller until it was an eggshell. And the woman sang, that is the shell you threw to me, even a witch can grateful be. And with a smile, she vanished cat, broom, shell, and all. And that is the story of the Gypsy Girl and the Grateful Witch. And that brings us to the end of our stories today. We have a few minutes left, so that gives me enough time to say thank you so much for joining me and allowing me to share these words from my upcoming book, Kitchen Witch, Food, Folklore and Fairy Tale. The book will be available to pre-order in November, so end of next month, we're nearly there. <laughs> if you're not familiar with the term pre-order, this means that you pay for the book ahead of time to reserve your copy, and it's super useful for indie publishers such as mine to take pre-orders because it gauges interest for the title, and that means that they can then pitch the book to the big booksellers and things. So it, it's super helpful to, to gauge interest. Uh, it also means when you pre-order that you are the first to get the book when it's out in print. So you usually get it a few days to a week before everybody else, and it will be out in March. So you'll get it early March. And then as a thank you for pre-ordering the book, uh, we always offer up goodies as a thank you for your, your faith and trust in the book. Um, so for, for me, I've written a couple of recipe ebooks and I've recorded a very special fairy tale that was too long to fit into Kitchen Witch, but it is a fairy tale about cake and magic and it is one of my favourites, but it, it was, uh, it's such a gorgeous tale and it was just too long to fit into the book, so I wanted to, to record it so that it would be a special treat for those that pre-ordered. So my darling one. Our next and final session of our Kitchen Witch readings will be in November. It's November the 16th. Uh, and again, like this event, you just head over to sentiayoga.com forward slash events and the link will just be there. Our final theme is Witches and the Fae. So it's Witches and Fairy Folk, Tales of Fairy Queens, Fairy Witches, and maybe a few Christmas seasonal sprites as well. So I'm I say I'm really looking forward to that one. I'm looking forward to all of them because uh, so many gorgeous tales, but the uh, the tales of the fairy folk are are particularly joyful. So thank you so much for everyone who joined me. It's always a real honor. Thank you for listening to me ramble on a little bit, but it's great fun. It's lovely to be able to connect in this way. And if you ever want to join me for other events, and that includes uh, book readings, uh, the yoga, the meditation, it's all on Sentia Yoga. So you can join me. I do as many free events as I can just so that anyone and everyone can join and it makes it lots of fun and we can all come together in this lovely way. If you have any questions, if there's anything you missed or you're not sure about, do please drop me an email or connect on social media anytime. So darling ones, I will bid you farewell. Mwah. Lots of love. I will see you soon. Goodbye for now.